Here we are with our Sunday School lesson for February the 19th. And gosh, it's hard to imagine that next Wednesday will be Ash Wednesday, next Sunday will be the first Sunday in Lent, and we'll be, we'll be traveling that journey with our Lenten studies, and there's a lot of great studies coming up. I, I went ahead and looked ahead at the quarterly and, and some of the lessons that we're going to have. But today we're going to continue in this series where we talk about love, we talk about true friendship. And the lesson title today is True Friendship. It comes out of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel. And the purpose statement is to examine what love looks like between friends. And it's probably one of the most beautiful love stories between friends that we find in the Bible. And it focuses on David and Jonathan. And, and we know a lot about David. I would encourage you, and our church is going through a series where every week um, all of the sermons and, and there's Bible studies going on. We're navigating through the entire book of the Bible, starting at Genesis and we'll end it at Revelation at the end of the year. But, but I would encourage you to look at 1 Samuel, look at 2 Samuel, and you can read it like, like a book, like a novel, because it's so fascinating to read about the life of David. There's 62 chapters in the Bible dedicated just to David. Chuck Swindoll, Charles Swindoll, wrote a book uh, about David, and I think some of his character studies are great. And the one about David, he, he subtitles that, that David was a man after God's own heart. And when I first saw that, and I've read that book more than once now, but when, when I first saw that book, I thought, well, gee, David did some things that certainly troubled God, and he did. And, and we also say we all do. But, it, but it's, it, it's such, such a great character study to think about the life of David. Some of David's life is, is certainly children's stories, the slaying of Goliath. Every child that goes to Sunday school early on, they hear about the story of David slaying Goliath. But this story today is about one of the, the most wonderful friendships in all of Scripture, and it's a friendship between Jonathan and David. Now, David was a musician in the king's court. Saul being the king. The battle between David and Goliath is over. Israel's champion and savior David's killed Goliath. The armies of Israel then routed the armies of the Philistines and chased them all the way back to their own territory. And after that, Saul's commander of the army, Abner, brought David to Saul so that Saul could find out about David's family. He wanted to know who this, who this young shepherd boy was. And Saul's son, Jonathan, was at that meeting. And today's lesson tell us, tells us what happened next. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm going to read the few passages that we've got. And like I have in the past, I'm going to read them out of my study Bible, my, uh, my Wesley study Bible. And we start with Samuel 18, 1 through 4. As soon as David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan's life became bound up with David's life. And Jonathan cared about David as much as he cared about himself. From that point forward, Saul kept David in his service and wouldn't allow him to return to his father's household. And Jonathan and David made a covenant together because Jonathan cared about David as much as he cared about himself. Jonathan took off his robe that he was wearing and gave it to David along with his armor as well as his sword his bow, and his belt. And David went out and was successful in every mission Saul sent him to do. So Saul placed him in charge of the soldiers, and this pleased all the troops, as well as Saul's servants. And then we jump over to 19, and we look at 19, 1 through 7. Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. Now that's a long way from where we just read. But Jonathan, Saul's son, liked David very much. So Jonathan warned David, my father Saul is trying to kill you. Be on guard tomorrow morning, stay somewhere safe and hide. I'll go out and stand by my father in the field where you'll be. I'll talk to my father about you and I'll tell you whatever I find out. So Jonathan spoke highly about David to his father Saul, telling him the king shouldn't do anything wrong to his servant David because he hasn't wronged you. In fact, his actions have helped you greatly. He risked his own life when he killed that Philistine, and the Lord won a great victory for all Israel. You saw it, and you were happy about it. Why then would you do something wrong to an innocent person by killing David for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and then swore, As surely as the Lord lives, David won't be executed. 
So Jonathan summoned David and told him everything they had talked about. Then Jonathan brought David back to Saul, and David served Saul as he had previously. And then we jump over to just a couple of more passages from 19 with 19 and 20. When Saul was told that David was in the camps at Ramah, he sent messengers to arrest David. They saw a group of prophets in a prophetic frenzy with Samuel standing there as their leader. God's Spirit came over Saul's messengers, and they also fell into a prophetic frenzy. So, before we dig into this story a little bit more, let's talk about friends. I just, I just want to think about friends for a second. Because we, we talk a lot about that. We talk about friendship. We all have friends. I think it's interesting, and I'm, I'm looking at our quarterly, uh, one of the first paragraphs, said Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote, friendship is the most necessary thing in life. Since no one wishes to live without friends, even if he has all other goods. Helen Keller said, walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light. And C.S. Lewis wrote, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. And how true that is, but how our, our identity, how our, our, our feelings about friends, how our feelings about friendships has changed over the last several years. And a lot of that is because of social media. I mean, a lot of us, a lot of the people listening to this get on Facebook. And Facebook is probably the most popular social media platform that's out there. And people talk about their friends. I, I'm on Facebook. And I have people that send me friend requests. And you can either acknowledge yes, that they'll accept that request, or no, I won't. Now, you're never told, or that person's never told if you say no, and sometimes we all know there, there's cloned pictures that go out and that sort of thing. But I thought it was interesting. I looked at, at my Facebook friends. I have 1,230 Facebook friends. <laughs> and I've often laughed and thought, of those 1,230 friends, and I do know most of them, or have had some interaction with, with most, if not all of them, I wonder if I sent out a request and said, you know, I'm getting ready to retire. And I'm going to quit working, so how about if each of you just once a month put $2 in an envelope and send it to me? Just that's all you have to do. It costs you what, I don't even know what a stamp is now, but 60 cents for a stamp. Put $2 in there once a month and just send it to me. And gosh, that's, that'd be $2,400 a month. And, and so every month I could count on having that $2,400. Now I laugh when I say that because first of all, I'm not going to do that, but I wonder how many people would actually take and put $2 in an envelope. There was a professor of evolutionary psychology who put that question to the test, and he cited this dramatic revolution in our social world, and he wondered if the size of our social media network had any correlation to how many friends we have in real life. The average number of Facebook friends possessed by people, according to this study, was around 150. But out of those 150, only 28, on average, were recognized by people as low-level friends. But then when participants were asked how many of those friends would help out in a time of need, a time of emotional distress, or some other crisis in the, their life, the average answer was four. Four people out of an average of 150 that they, they felt like would really come to their need if there was, there was some crisis in their life. They did say that around 14 would express some sympathy, and I think it's interesting. People post on, on Facebook and they post about some crisis in their life, some tragedy in their life, and, and people will, will respond in some way. Most people not even with a comment, but a few with a, with a thumbs up or a heart or some sort of acknowledgement. So even though we might have 150 or maybe even 150 thousand Facebook friends, our true relationship with the vast majority of these people is essentially insignificant. And that's what makes this special relationship with, with Jonathan and David so remarkable, because they truly loved, they truly cared for each other. Now, I, I want to look for a second at, at the fact that Jonathan's love for David is expressed in attitudes and his actions. And I think those are two particular traits that we need to think about. And so I want to examine those two. First of all, when we look at attitudes, love is strong. It's helpful to keep in mind this lesson that we just read, this passage we just read, David was most likely a teenager. 
Now, 20 was the age of conscription when you went into the Israelite army. And so until David appeared on the battlefield, he was serving as a shepherd on his father's farm in Bethlehem. Now, on the other hand, Jonathan was much older than David. Jonathan was already a soldier in his father's army. In fact, we, we can read later in Samuel that he can't, uh, commanded about 600 men. And so sometime prior to the battle between Goliath and David, Jonathan, his armor bearer, went to a Philistine garrison and killed 20 Philistine soldiers. And this action caused panic throughout the whole camp, and they started killing. Eventually the Philistines fled, and through the leadership of Jonathan, the Lord saved Israel that day. So we know that Jonathan was clearly older than David, and he was a national hero. He had defeated the Philistines, and he, he was perhaps even a hero to David. And so he would have, and David would have known about the exploits of Jonathan because the people talked about it. Jonathan was a courageous warrior, and he saved the nation of Israel. And he gained great recognition as the nation's savior, and he was tremendously popular among the people. And again, you can read that if you, if you take the time to read further uh, into Samuel. Now, I think it's even more important to recognize that Jonathan was in line to succeed his father Saul as the next king over Israel. And so it would be understandable if Jonathan was jealous of the fact that David came along and killed this giant and was getting the recognition that he was. All of a sudden, he was incredibly popular. But in verse 1, we see that as soon as he, David, had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, which was the beginning of this deep and lasting friendship. Instead of there being rivalry between these two, there was this tremendous unity. They, they were joined together. Their souls were joined together. And Jonathan bound himself to David in the strongest possible way. So it seems that Jonathan's love for David was strong because Jonathan saw in David what he himself had, a love for God and for the people of God. And David had been outraged by Goliath's defiance of God. He had gone out and battled against the one who defied God. Jonathan had early battled against the enemies of God because of his commitment to God and the people. And so here's this common bond between Jonathan and David was their faith in the Lord. And that's what made Jonathan's love so strong for David. I think the second thing that we look at is that love is selfless. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. We read that. In fact, that statement is repeated again in verse 3. Jonathan loved him as his own soul, Jesus, and we remember this, Jesus said you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you love someone as much as you love yourself, you're unselfish. Now, it's unlikely that Jonathan had any hint at this point in time that the Lord would select David to be the next king over Israel. But whatever point that it became clear to Jonathan that David was going to be the next king and not himself, he was able to say, and again, we can read this in 1 Samuel 23, you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. He wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of Israel. He was thinking of his great friend David and all the appreciation he had for him. And so in this regard, he was selfless. Love is selfless. I want you to reflect for a second and just pause for a second as, as we continue this lesson. And think of someone in your life, and there has been somebody in your life, maybe more than one person in your life, who truly was selfless. Somebody that you've known, it might have been a family member, it might have been a friend, who carried more about you than they even carried about themselves. And, and look at what happens. What we see in Jonathan is nothing less than a man who has been set free from worldly thinking and selfish concerns, so as to truly love God and others. Jonathan was not selfish wanting power and possessions and people for himself. His focus was on God and the things of God. And he, because he trusted fully in the Lord, he was freed from the trappings of self and selfishness. He was able to give himself wholeheartedly and freely to love God and others. And his ultimate priority was not himself. His ultimate priority was the Lord. Now think about that. Think about, and, and we've all been in situations like that. I've been involved, you go all the way back to school, to high school, I remember elections where I would run for a class officer and maybe somebody else would get it. Was I jealous? No. Was I disappointed? Yeah, a little bit. 
But there were times I was glad, and there were other people when, when I was the victor, when I was the one choosing for a team. There were times, okay, we've got so many places on this team, we're going to, we're, we're going to play baseball, and there's only so many first base, only one first base, one second base, and one. And if you get selected, great. If not, how did you feel about that other person? Were you able to say, it's okay, because you're a great player? <clears throat> and let's look at how love is expressed in actions. And there's two actions that I want to talk about. The first is, is to look at the fact, and we, we saw this in the passage, that love is covenantal. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. A covenant is nothing more than an agreement between two parties. And the exact relationship will vary depending upon the situation, but Jonathan repeated this covenant to David more times in, in the years and the months ahead. And Jonathan's covenant with David represented commitment, it represented dedication, and it represented loyalty in his love for David. <clears throat> now, I think one of the things that gets talked about sometimes, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, and that's that this relationship between David and Jonathan was also a physical relationship. And I just want to take two seconds <clears throat> Excuse me. to say that I think it's, that's ridiculous. I think it's preposterous. And I think that anybody that looks at this passage will realize that that was not the case here. What we do know is that Jonathan's friendship with David was remarkable. It was a remarkable expression of faithful love. The love of two very close friends. And it wasn't just expressed in words, but also in deeds. Later, when Saul's attention turned to killing David, Jonathan got in the middle. And, and again, he, he went to bat for David. He protected David. When Jonathan died, David expressed his love by taking care of Jonathan's son, who was brought into David's life to care for. A covenantal love between friends is committed, dedicated, and loyal. Think about the robe that Jonathan gave to David. It wasn't just any robe. It was his royal robe. It was his symbol that he was going to rule over the kingdom of Israel. He wore it because he was Saul's son. But he was willing to give up that claim because he knew that that was what God wanted him to do. When we think about that, there was a, there was a story that I was reminded of when I think about the act of him giving up his right to the throne, and, and many of you have heard that story. There was a documentary called A King's Story, and it was a story of the life of Great Britain's King Edward VIII and his abdication of the throne because he loved a woman. He, he loved an American woman who was a divorcee, and he was going to marry her. He was going to marry her in order to marry her because of his love for her, and he had to give up the throne. And he had to make a choice, but he made that choice. And on December 10th, 1936, with his three brothers beside him, the king signed the instrument of abdication. The 11 months of his reign had ended. The night before, on December the 9th, the king called Mrs. Simpson to inform her of his decision. And she pleaded with him not to abdicate. But he said, the abdication documents are being drawn up. You can do whatever you wish. You can go wherever you want, but wherever you go, I'm going to follow you. Jonathan showed that kind of love for David. He gave himself to David. He gave up his road. He abdicated his right to the throne. And that's what this was. David would take precedence, and Jonathan would rejoice. And that's the other thing that love does. Love is giving, which is a second action. I think about that. I think about this lesson. I, I, I couldn't help, as I was preparing this lesson, to think about people in my life. And, and, and I, I have kept a lot of letters, and over the years I'll get letters, and some, some are very special, and I've kept them. I've kept them in, 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 a, in a notebook. Because when I look at those letters, I look back at people that, that I've had a relationship with that have been friends, that have been friends where we've, we've been through something together. We've been through challenging times together. And yet we became stronger because of our friendship, because of our love for each other. Sometimes we don't express that. Sometimes we don't express it. Two men for each other, or I think women have more of a tendency to say to another woman that they, they love her, but, but for men sometimes that's an uncomfortable thing because they don't want it to be misinterpreted. 
but we do love, and we love deeply, and we have great respect. And what a beautiful story this is about two people from thousands of years ago and about their friendship and how their friendship was bound together. I want you to reflect on that. I want you to go back and read this story and then think about the people in your life that you've had that special friendship with. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just ask you to, to continue to guide us, to continue to lead us. We do think about our friends. And it's important we do that. Friends that we have said goodbye to, but the memories of those friends, those special times with those, for those people that when we needed something, when maybe out of the blue we got a call we hadn't expected, but at that moment we knew it was a call that we needed. Maybe it was a, a note that we opened from the mail that, that we weren't expecting, but because of our special friendship, that friend knew that it was a point in time that we needed something. We ask as we go throughout this week that you continue to keep our eyes open to the things you want us to see, our ears open to the things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with love that we can share with each other, that we can share to create new friendships, and we can build on all of the love that you have given us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.